here in Houston. And it is, of course, sad duty, which brings us here. We are in building number nine of the complex. This is where the astronauts do some of their training. There are simulated pieces of the shuttle all around us, a payload bay here, a cockpit over there, a tail section. Ordinarily, this would be a space junkie's paradise. For someone who grew up with the space program, this is where the magic happened. Tonight, there is no magic here at all. All you see is a broken shuttle and broken hearts. For the third time since the beginning of the space program, we were reminded in the worst possible way that space flight only seems magical. People build spacecraft, not wizards, and people sometimes make mistakes. Parts sometimes fail. Fate intervenes. Finding out why is what happens now. Was it a bad tile, a piece of insulation? Did Columbia simply wear out? We just don't know, and neither does anyone else. Some interesting theories, yes, but nothing concrete, and we know from Challenger that jumping to conclusions is dangerous business. So it may be a while, a long while, before we really know. A day and a half since Columbia broke apart, we only know the simple things for certain. Seven good, daring people died, and millions more are hurting, not the least of whom are the men and women so busy tonight in the buildings all around us here. But they have been here before, and so have we. And along with the magic and the discovery, that too is a reality of manned space flight. And so we begin this special edition of Newsnight, as we always do with the whip, and there's a lot to cover in the whip. We'll start out with the latest on the investigation. Miles O'Brien has covered this story with extraordinary distinction since it broke yesterday morning. Miles, a headline from you tonight. Aaron, a day of uh, raw emotion and some raw numbers. NASA managers laid a lot of technical cards on the table for us today. This in stark contrast to what happened after Challenger. And while nothing is being ruled out, it is leading us towards some ideas of what might have happened to Columbia. Miles, thank you. We'll get back to you at the top of this hour. A crucial part of that investigation, of course, is collecting every piece of debris possible. Ed Lavendera, following that part of the story tonight. Ed, the headline from you. Aaron, there's so much to do here on the ground for local authorities who have enlisted the help of volunteers to find all of the debris. They say it will take uh, several days, perhaps even weeks, and local officials here want the federal government to know that they need help. Aaron? Ed, thank you. CNN's Patty Davis has been talking to one of the people who will lead one of the investigations. So, Patty, a headline from you tonight. The retired admiral heading up the independent investigation into the shuttle accident promises a quick and thorough look at what happened. But is his team truly independent? Aaron? Patty, thank you. And finally, in the whip tonight, a look at how the president spent his day and, more importantly, the challenges he'll face surrounding this disaster. For that, we go to our senior White House correspondent, John King. John, a headline from you. Aaron, tragedy adding to what already was a big week ahead for the president in the morning here at the White House. He will get an update on the investigation from the NASA administrator. On Tuesday, he will lead the nation in mourning a memorial service for the seven astronauts in Houston, Texas. Mr. Bush began this day in church. His head bowed as the minister told the congregation, this is more than we can stomach. John, thank you. Back to you and the rest of you shortly. Also coming up in the next hour, and we'll be here for two, a city that lives and breathes its space program and reveres the men and women behind it for personal, for Houston rather, this is personal, something we learned as we arrived here this evening. Personal as well for those few who have gone where Columbia has gone. The fellow astronauts past and present will talk with one of them, one of the grand pioneers of the American space effort, Gene Cernan, on what now for NASA. And Beth Nissen tonight on how NASA regrouped after the Challenger disaster and how long it took to get the shuttle back where it belongs, in space. A roadmap for the days ahead. All of that to come. We begin with laying out as best we can where things stand at this moment. You heard John King tell us that President and Mrs. Bush will travel here on Tuesday for a memorial service at the Space Center. The recovery effort, which is a mammoth undertaking, has turned up the remains of some of the seven astronauts, according to NASA, not all seven, as had been reported earlier. And on the investigation, there are, in fact, three investigations and still more in the works. NASA spearheading one of them. 
another being led by an independent panel drawn from the Transportation Department, other government agencies, and the armed services, and a third investigation being conducted under the auspices of, of the Congress. All of that is going on now. A lot of hands on deck already coming at the investigation from a number of different angles, each important, all looking for the same precise answer. Why did it happen? We begin tonight with CNN's Miles O'Brien. The first sign of trouble began as Columbia streaked over Northern California at 8.53 a.m. Eastern Time. Temperature sensors inside the control flaps at the trailing edge of the orbiter's wings suddenly register zeros, as if the lines were cut. Those cables wound their way through the left wheel well, and at the same time, the temperature inside it was spiking, rising 20 to 30 degrees in five minutes. One minute later, 8.54 Eastern, a temperature sensor inside the left fuselage records a 60-degree increase over five minutes. The right side is up 15 degrees, perfectly normal. Four minutes later, 8.58, Columbia is over New Mexico, and the orbiter is pulling to the left. The computer-driven autopilot compensates by moving those flaps, called elevons, in the opposite direction. Does this mean something to us? We're not sure. It can be indicative of rough tile. It can be indicative of perhaps missing tile. In the left wheel well, those temperature sensors go silent one by one. One minute later, 8.59, Columbia's computers are still trying to compensate for that bank to the left, and then there is nothing. A loss of signal, but not a complete loss, it appears. We do believe that there, are, there is additional information to us, uh, another 32 seconds that we believe if we go into our computer system on the ground that we can pull out additional data it means the vehicle may have been intact enough to be transmitting something. No one knows how useful that data may be. NASA engineers are also focusing a lot of attention on the beginning of Columbia's final voyage. About 80 seconds after launch, a piece of foam, or perhaps some ice, fell off the shuttle's orange external fuel tank. It struck somewhere underneath the left wing. Is it a coincidence or a smoking gun? Neither is being ruled out. But NASA says when engineers spotted the debris after reviewing high-speed film of the launch shot with a long telephoto, there was a lot of discussion about how much damage that debris might have caused. It's not unusual to see foam and ice fall off fuel tanks, and the shuttle team determined the damage was probably not significant. But perhaps more to the point, no matter how bad the damage, there was nothing anyone on the ground or in orbit could do. Many people have wondered why the astronauts might not have been able to conduct a spacewalk, at least to create, have some sort of visual inspection to see what was going on with those tiles. But the real issue is there is no tile repair kit on a space shuttle. Putting on these tiles is an extremely laborious process. It takes a lot of time in a hangar, much less in the vacuum of space. The other issue is, could they have changed their angle of attack somewhat on the way down in order to change the way they heated it all up? What the uh, shuttle program manager told us today is they already come in in the most optimum way to avoid heating things up too much. So there really was no option uh, if, in fact, that was the case. Well, uh, Miles, we're in one of those situations where I think um, a, a lot of people have been following this all day long. Other people are just coming to it tonight, and we'll try and get everyone on the same page in, in a couple of questions. Um, are you surprised at all by the amount of information you've gotten so far compared, for example, to the Challenger investigation? Uh, it, it bowls me over. It's, uh, it's astounding. When you look back at the historical record of what was released immediately in the wake of uh, Challenger, it was, uh, they were stonewalling. And part of the problem was that the agency had some real serious problems at its core. And uh, there were many people who knew that there were voices of discontent, strong voices, on the eve of that launch saying it was unsafe to launch in that weather and so nasa was uh, stonewalling seventeen years ago this time it's an entirely different thing uh... it's almost as if we are um, going along for the ride if you will as this in the investigation unfolds it's it's quite refreshing and is it possible if it's well let me see if it's possible to answer the question is this investigation more or less complex more or less difficult 
than figuring out what happened to the Challenger. The Challenger was grounded for, or the shuttle program was grounded for, for two years. Yes, uh, and, and just talking about that time span for just a second, uh, when it was finally determined what happened, it turned out to be those O-rings, those uh, connecting O-rings inside the solid rocket boosters which line the outside of the external tank. When it was finally decided that was the problem, there was an inherent design flaw there, and so they had to redesign those solid rocket boosters, and that accounts for much of the time that was involved between Challenger and the return to flight nearly uh, three years later. So uh, that is one issue. Now, as far as the whole issue of complexity, uh, it's, it's almost impossible for uh, me to assess which would be more complex. Uh, in each case, you had a vehicle with a million parts. Uh, it hasn't changed over 17 years that much. And when you're talking about something with a million parts, you're talking about an incredibly complicated task trying to figure out what went wrong.